Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well and staying healthy and safe uh, during this time. Uh, my name is Zach DeLoretto, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Toronto. Um, and in conjunction with Sarah, who's also a PhD student at the University of Toronto uh, in the same department, we will be delivering uh, the soils module for the 2020 Envirothon. Um, so to start, I'll maybe just give a slight introduction about what uh, we'll be doing today and maybe maybe my, my expertise might help too. Um, so for the past three years, I've been helping the Envirothon um, do the soils module. So maybe some of you have seen me before or you know come to the in-person uh, training session, uh, as well as the testing day as well. I've been involved in both. Um, and my background is in, in biogeochemistry, so I work a lot with soils, a lot with soil microbes, and their ability to mineralize and make minerals, right? So uh, that's my expertise sort of in this area, and I'm happy to answer any questions at any point after this. Uh, the organizers have my email, and I can make that available to you guys as well. But for today's, or my portion, of the module and my little video demonstration. Um, we'll be going through the textural classification of soils. So I'll spend you know, the first maybe five or 10 minutes or something giving a small introduction about textual classification of soil, uh, maybe a little bit of how soils form. Um, I know Sarah will be covering a lot of that stuff in her, her portion. Um, so I'll be covering the textual classification of soils um, and then how to measure this, You know how we would measure this in the laboratory. And then we have a nice little activity, which is normally what I would do with you guys um, at the workshop, uh, of how to do this soil texture, textural classification by hand using just the soils and, and some water and you know a nice little flow chart that we have in the provided materials. So to start off, we'll start with maybe this introduction into the textural classification of soils. Um, so if we think about soils, they're made from parent material, and soils can consist of rocks and minerals. Um, they can consist of both. But one of the, the fundamental uh, classifications of these soil is from a physical perspective, and that is rooted in their particle size. Now, you know, in the broadest aspect, um, you know, this particle size is composed of three different classes, uh, known as the sand, silt, and clay sizes. Now, if you look to your right, my, my left, but this is reversed, um, we have these three classifications in a table and the actual size of the particles that this encompasses. So if you look at our first one, which is sand, which is the largest, there's actually um, a lot of variation in the, in the type of sand, but we're mainly com concerned with just sand in general. So from the lowest bound to the upper bound um, is what we would consider sand. So that would be you know, 0 0.05 millimeters to two millimeters in size. Anything bigger than two millimeters in size is considered like a pebble or a cobblestone or any number of other um, classifications, but we're not concerned with that for figuring out the texture class. So sand is our upper bound and that's its size. And then we have sort of the middle one, which is silt, which is from 0 0.02 millimeters to 0 0.05 millimeters. And then we have our smallest one, uh, which is one of the most important ones, which is clay. And I'll get into that in a minute, but Clay is less than 0.02 millimeters. Now, the reason that this textural classification, this size-based classification, is the basis for sort of our, our soil or our understanding of what our soil is, is a lot of these, even though they're only physical, have significant implications for the, the behavior of the soil in the environment, and also um, a lot of its chemical properties, you know, and other physical properties are derived from this specific uh, textural classification. Now. The easiest way to highlight that example is if we think about these sizes and, and take their names at face value. So if we think about a sand, you know, in the sand at a beach, and we pour water onto sand, a lot of the time, the sand doesn't really stick together that well. I mean, maybe you've made a sand castle, right? It, you know, sticks together, but not that great, and the water flows through it. Um, but as we decrease in size, you know, with this silt and clay particles, they actually hold the water better. Um, and Sarah may have mentioned this, but if we think about this from an environmental perspective, uh, for growing crops, for having a healthy soil, for having healthy trees, uh, right? Not a lot of vegetation grows in the sand. So we do, we want our soils to hold on to the water and hold on to some of these ions and things that are in the water. And clays and silt do a particularly good job of that. Um, clays is probably the most important because if you know, you know anything about clays, they have what's known as a sheet structure. So clay minerals, 
when there's more than one of them, they form this nice, you know, rearranging of themselves in these different sheets. Now in between those sheets are spaces um, because these sheets are held together electrostatically. So these spaces allow for infiltration of water and they hold on to ions and organic material, which, you know, are really important aspects of a good soil for growing crops or maintaining a healthy forest. Um, silt is, is less so, but it's, you know, still important in that regard. But if, you know, we think about this, um, you know, from a healthy soil, right, we want actually sort of a range of these properties, you know, so having 100% sand or 100% clay isn't necessarily the best. You know, if we have too much sand, no water is going to be holding on, right? No water is going to be there to stay and no plants are going to be able to, to sort of solidify their roots and grow in this soil. You know, on the other hand, well, we think maybe we want 100% clay because it'll hold all the water. You know, the plants can, can stick to it, they can grow in it, but that's not also, that's also not true um, because if we're holding on all, all the water, the soil can become waterlogged, right? You know, clay has low permeability, so water doesn't flow through it very well uh, if it's all clay. And then you can get sort of this anoxic soil that's low in oxygen, um, you know, because once organic material starts to degrade in this type of soil, there's no input of oxygen or no cycling out of this material. It consumes all the oxygen and makes an anoxic sort of unhealthy soil for a lot of plants and, uh, you know, flora and fauna don't grow in it well. So that's sort of the basis of why this textual classification is important. It's why I'm, it's important to understand these, you know, and this textual classification has a lot of other um, implications for physical properties, but we'll maybe just briefly touch on those once I go into the next part, which is, well, we know this textual classification is important. How do we determine that in a soil? So in a laboratory, we would use what's called the hydrometer. So this hydrometer is shown here, sort of just in a, in a schematic diagram. Um, and a hydrometer essentially works on a scientific law called Stokes' Law. And Stokes' Law tells us how fast particles will move or settle in this case um, through a, a fluid of known viscosity. So if we know the particle size and we know the viscosity of the fluid, we can determine how long it will take for a particle of a known diameter. Um, in this case, we know that, right? That's from our, our previous sort of definition of these three classifications, right? We can determine how fast it'll settle. And if we think about, you know, liquids where we know the viscosity, water is obviously the most important one, so we use water. But the also interesting thing is we know the density of water. So we can take a measurement of density at these known times to figure out how much soil is still suspended in the liquid. And using that, we can calculate, you know, at these given time points, what percentage uh, of the soil has settled out to the bottom of our little hydrometer test here. So the way we set this up is we oven dry our soils, remove all the original water, so they're not any different densities, and we remove organic material. Um, and the reason we remove organic material, this is particularly important, is because organic material um, can overestimate or lead to an overestimation of the clay fraction because of its size. A lot of organic material is not something obvious like sticks and, you know, whatever else. It's, it's colloidal, uh, which has the same size range as the clay. So this colloidal material will settle out at the same rate, but it can also um, absorb, which means to stick to other soil particles, changing their size usually they stick to the clays so really important to remove that um, and why you know maybe when you were collecting your soil i specified not to take the top soil um, you know from wherever you you got your soil you know especially if they were they were potted plants inside the house but anyway this hydrometer measurement um, you know after it's all said and done they usually take about four or five hours we get these different fractions so we get the amount of sand we have which settles out first and we get the amount of silt we have, which is the second measurement. And then the final measurement um, is how much clay has settled out. And then we can, you know, back calculate this into a soil texture based off of what's known as a soil triangle. So what I can, you know, tell you maybe more about this is if you decide you want to pursue environmental science and soil science, you will definitely do um, a hydrometer at some point. Um, you know, and the other reason the hydrometer is important, not just for determining our, our soil textural classes for, you know, soil health and farming and ecology and growing food and these other things. <coughs> soil textural classification is important in construction materials because the amount of sand, silt, and clay 
you know, determines factors like compaction. And if you're building, you know, you want to be an engineer and you go into civil engineering and, you know, build a road, you go out and you need to measure this compaction because you need to know, um, you know, how the soil is going to behave when you build on it. Right. Um, I happened to be involved with AMEC for a couple summers when I was doing my undergrad as a co-op placement. And although I wasn't doing the hydrometers, there was an entire section of a, a pretty big lab to do hydrometers um, nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, with the weekend crew doing them because they're just so um, important for that type of industry and for construction. But uh, moving on. So we have these values at this point you know, these three different fractions, we use what's known as the soil triangle, which is the proper name is a ternary diagram. So it's three axis plot with each of our components on one side. And what we do is we take these percentages that we've calculated and plot them on each of their uh, corresponding axes. So I've, you know, you'll have access to this blank one. And the main thing we need to know or how to go through is how to read this. So the easiest way to read this um, is if we look at this percentage of clay here, right? This is our one axis. It goes from 0% clay to 100% clay. Same with silt. It goes from 0% silt to 100% silt. And then same with sand. It goes from 0 to 100%. And these, all three components need to add up to 100%, right? Because that makes, makes sense, right? We have an original soil. Its components all fall into these three categories because they're purely physical and we don't lose anything or gain anything when we're, we're doing the hydrometer. Um, so once we know that, we can plot them. So for example, say we have 45% clay, 45% silt, and 10% sand. This is what I've plotted here. We can plot those, right? So we can go to 45% clay and we draw a line across. And we go to 45% silt, draw a line across, and 10% sand and draw a line across. And where the three intersect, you know, whichever portion of the plot those three intersect, that is our soil texture class. In this case, it would be a silty clay. <coughs> so for you guys, um, being able to read this diagram is extremely important uh, because a lot of the time or some of the questions this will be given to you, you'll be given, you know, 20% sand, 30% clay, and 50% silt. And you'll need to plot those properly um, across this diagram, right? And the nice thing about this diagram is if we look at it, there's all these smaller triangles, right? So it's easy to follow where you, you need to plot these lines. Now, that sort of covers the sort of little introductory um, spiel I need to give. So you guys are sort of understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it and why it's important for soils and the environment. Um, but now we think about, you know, in the field. In the field, I can't bring the hydrometer out. It's, you know, it needs to be on a stable platform. Um, a lot of the times they'll be on what are known as vibration tables to stop any vibrations from disturbing the, the soil, right, in the solution, the water, in the actual cylinder, the, the graduated cylinder. Because if it starts vibrating, right, some of these small particles, it doesn't take very much energy to resuspend them, and that can throw off the measurements, you know. So we can't really do this in the field. So in the field, you're more reliant on hand tests or these things that you can do to give an estimate of what type of soil you're dealing with and what its components are. Now this will be where you need your materials that you know you would have been maybe asked to gather before. I have them all right here. We'll move the camera down in a minute to take a look. Um, but what we'll be doing are these series of hand tests and by combining them and following a flow chart um, we can assign a textural class to whatever soil you've gathered. Or you know if you go to a field and it's not the same as some other soil you've seen before you can do the same thing and follow the same procedure to identify the textural class of your soil. So what we have here, I'll scroll down, are these three tests. <coughs> we have this field test, this ball squeeze test, and this ribbon test. So what I can do is I'll change the camera angle now and we can sort of demonstrate what each of these tests are and how to do them and then we'll move on to the flow chart and we can go through sort of an identification of the soil. So down here, We've got sort of our things that we need. We've got our two soils here, you know, a mixing bin. I've got some water on the side here, you know, a thing to maybe measure how much water I've added or how much soil, just add a little bit. And we've got a spoon. Uh, the spoon is to sort of crush these little ped things. I don't know if you can see them here, but see along the edge here. Those are those peds that we want to crush up. 
So the field test, you know, you can actually do moist or dry. Um, so I have these two soils here. I mean, you can sort of see the, the different coloration, right? So I feel this one. You know, I don't know how your soil feel, but this one's like, you know, feels a little bit gritty, right? You can hear that. Um, some people will say you can put it in your mouth to do sort of a taste test, but I wouldn't recommend that, but you can taste the sand. It feels crunchy, right, as opposed to the silt or clay. And then if I take my other soil here and, you know, squeeze it and feel it, right, it's a little bit more smooth. It's not as um, gritty. So just based off that initial dry test, we can assume maybe that this one's going to have more sand and this one has more, more silt and clay. You know, and if we think about uh, what we talked about before with the water holding capacity of these materials, we're not operating in the same mode we would be when we're looking at a hydrometer. These would be more along the lines of, you know, evaluating our clay fraction, right? Because the clay fraction, um, you know, imparts probably the strongest or the easiest to see physical properties of the soil, right? So if we have tons of clay, it's going to hold on to a lot of water, which is why we're doing this with moist soil. If it has a lot of sand, it's not going to hold on to the water well. So a lot of these tests, you're going to be able to see that. So I'll start with this bottom soil first, you know, and we'll do each of these tests separately. So I'll add some soil here to my little mixing table. And you can see the ped there, right? I can just sort of crush these with my spoon. Usually in the lab, we'd use a mortar and, and pestle, but the spoon is fine here. And we can see we've got this organic material, right? For a hydrometer, this sort of matters, but for this, not so much. And then what I'll do is I'll add some water to my little mixing thing here. And then you don't want to oversaturate the soil. So I'll slowly add a little bit of water at a time, you know. And then you can mix this with your hands. You can mix it with the spoon. Doesn't really matter. So you don't want any of this liquid water sitting around. But what you do want is you want this... Uh, you know, sort of darker, darker colored um, soil, which we can see now, right? So now, you know, I've added a little bit of water. My soil is moist, but not saturated. Now, if your soil does become, you know, saturated and there's a lot of water in it, you can always add more soil to it, right? Uh, if there's too much soil, you can always add more water, so it's nice and easy. But so this first test we'll be doing, right? And move this to the, the center for you guys this is this field test so much like the the way i did the dry test i'm you know rubbing it between my fingers here and you can feel a little bit of the grittiness right it's not very smooth and it is a little bit gritty um, so this test is the easiest really straightforward to do um, and you know if you've ever felt sand before it's pretty pretty nice uh, qualitative test and you should be familiar with that feeling next we have the ball squeeze test so with the ball squeeze test what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we're going to make a ball with this soil, right? And then we're going to try and squeeze the ball and see if it, you know, maintains its integrity. So in this case, I'm trying to make a ball, right? And it's, it's rather difficult to make the ball. If you can see this, right? It's taking me a little, a little while here to do it. But I did sort of get a ball, right? And now, you know, with this ball test, we want to apply pressure to it. And if it maintains its integrity, it's got a lot of clay. If it sort of just crumbles and falls apart, uh, it sort of is not. It's mostly sand, right? So if I squeeze this, it, it breaks pretty easily, but it still stays together for the most part, right? So there is likely a high amount of sand, but also a little bit of clay and silt in there probably, right? And then the last one, the last test we want to do is called the ribbon test. So the ribbon test um, is similar to the ball test, but in this case, instead of making a ball, we're going to make a ribbon, right? So if you've ever played with Play-Doh, you know, I always do that, you know, this thing to make like the, the snake with Play-Doh. That's the same sort of thing you want to do with, um, you know, your, your soil for the ribbon test, right? And if we look at sort of our description here, we've got sandy or sandy soils, boat ribbon, loam, silt, clay, clay loam will be less than one inch. Sandy clay, silt clay, one to two inches. Sandy clay, silty clay, or clay soils will be easy to ribbon, and you'll really, really see that. So uh, you may need a ruler for this. I can usually um, eye it because I've done this before. But, um, you know, just 
sort of doing this just really quickly. The soil that I have, this clearly, clearly doesn't ribbon at all, right? It just sort of falls apart. So I know um, that this soil is most likely a sandy soil, right? Rather than one that's like heavy in clay and has a lot of silt. It's mostly sand, but there could be a little bit of clay and silt in there. So the real question then comes down to, I've narrowed it down to there being a little bit of sand and a little bit of silt. Well, how do I know exactly what the soil textural class is? Well, that's where the, the next part comes into. And we'll use, you know, we'll actually use the other soil for that. We can go through the, the properties that we saw with this soil first and then move on to the next one uh, and do the, the flow chart. Right, so we've got this flow chart, which should be in the materials that you guys uh, were given. And in this one, it says to place approximately 25 grams of soil in your palm. We don't need 25 grams. We just need enough to make, you know, these balls and these, these ribbons, right? We don't actually need 25 grams. You know, so you follow this thing and see, does the soil remain in a ball when squeezed? No. Is the soil too dry? No. Is the soil too wet? No. Well, in that case, it's the sand. We saw with ours, we added enough water. We could make a little bit of a ball but not really a lot. So we follow the flow chart down. Does the soil remain in a ball when squeezed? Yes, sort of, okay. Then we move to the ribbon test. And in the case of a ribbon test, uh, we saw that it doesn't really make a ribbon at all. It was very difficult to make a ribbon, so we would probably say no. So this is a loamy sand, right? That's where we would go with our flow chart. So I know for a fact, these are actually the soils we use um, in the second year course at the university, that this is not this is, sorry, that this is actually a loamy sand. I know for a fact this is a loamy sand. We've done the hydrometer on this, so we know that this is loamy sand. And now we sort of know that this, you know, hand sample stuff works, right? Or is relatively accurate. So now we'll move on to the second soil that we have, right? And it's pretty dark, and we'll do the same thing. We'll, you know, break up these peds. If they are peds, some of them might be rocks. That's a rock. So we'll get some more of that. You know, we did our, our dry, our dry field, our dry field test, and we know that, you know, it feels a little bit like a clay. So there's probably some clay. And that darker color, too, maybe indicates that there's some clay. But we'll do the same thing. We'll add our water. You know, and let it soak up this water. And we'll, we'll really, really see the difference really, really, you know, quickly. Add a little too much water there. We'll add some more water. All right, so we'll... This piece got enough, slightly not enough water. So we'll add a little bit more. You know, we just want to get a good piece that's nice and nice and moist and not too too wet, right? And once we do that, we've got a nice a nice piece here now. And we start with our field test. We know that it's you know a little bit smooth, and now we do this ball test, right? And if you watch me sort of make this ball here, you know, this has a little bit too much too much water in it, but not not so much. So this is good. Right, so now we have this ball, right? You can see this ball that we made. If we squeeze this, the ball is really easy to make and it, it really stays intact. So we already know off the bat that it's it's probably higher in clay and silt content, but makes the ball so we can move on to the, the next part, right? And see if we can make a ribbon. So we can do this along here. You know, we can start to make a ribbon, right? So we look to our, our sort of first part of the flow diagram here, right? Is does the soil make a ribbon less than two centimeters or 2.5 centimeters long before breaking? So this hasn't broken yet. And this is definitely longer than 2.5 centimeters. So the answer is no. So then we're looking in the range of, is it 2.5 to five centimeters long before breaking? You know, and if we keep doing this, we can probably easily make this longer than, you know, it broke there, but I put a little too much pressure on it. But this one, anyway, we can probably make it longer than five centimeters, right? So then we want to go back to our field test after that point, right? Because we've reached sort of the upper bound for this ribbon test. And we want to pinch a small bit uh, between, you know, our palm and our forefinger here, right? And we're doing another field test to rub it, right? And at this point, you can't really, you can't really tell what I'm feeling, but I can tell you it feels really smooth, right? It spreads really smooth. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of grittiness, right? So if we look at our, our sort of flow diagram here, right, we've gotten to this point. 
Does the soil feel very gritty? No. Does the soil feel very smooth? Yes. Well, it does feel very smooth. So the clay would feel, you wouldn't really feel anything. It would just feel like mud. This you can feel, you know, some smooth and like a not very gritty. So at this point, we would conclude and say that this is our silty clay. So at this point, you know, we've seen this, you know, series of hand tests and you can try it with your, your soil and, and follow along with the same, uh, you know, flow chart and the same methodology. And, you know, that is sort of the main takeaway or one of the main takeaways from this, from this module. Um, and that covers everything that I was going to show you guys with the soil textural classifications. I hope it was informative and I hope you, you know, got the materials to do it yourself and try it out. You know, I like playing in the dirt and that's, you know, half the reason why I got into environmental science. Um, so I hope you take the time to do this and I hope you enjoyed this little video. Maybe it's something to keep you from being bored during these times. Um, and I thank you for watching and I wish you the best of luck with the other modules. Uh, thank you.